Welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months. The dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living, and our climate. A year on from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, we're going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Steve Waygood. Steve is the Chief Responsible Investment Officer at Aviva Investors and set up their Global Responsible Investment Team. And he co-founded the World Benchmarking Alliance and the UN Sustainable Stock Exchange Team. A lot has changed since filming was completed. We're seeing huge investors such as BlackRock and oil companies and governments using the Ukraine-derived energy crisis as a way of re-legitimizing oil and gas investment. The UK government's just announced it's rushing to put out 100 new licenses for North Sea oil and gas exploration, as well as commencing fracking. What will be the implications of this for responsible investing? Hmm. So I can see why that's happening, actually. Um, if you look at it through the lens of poverty and through the lens of what people alive today can afford to spend on their energy bills, um, I can see why the politicians who are elected by those that are obviously alive now would do that because it's this inflation that we're seeing in the energy bills is, is huge, of course. And that has pretty profound consequences for individuals and what they can afford to do and whether they can even afford to heat their home. So I, it's, it's almost painful to say it from a climate change perspective, but it's understandable. What it isn't understandable, the, the perspective that it's not understandable from is if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody yet to be born, say a hundred years away, because the costs that they will then incur as a consequence of climate change and the physical risk, if it goes beyond tipping points and runs away, the costs that they will incur and the quality of life that they will possibly even endure rather than enjoy will be significantly different, possibly cataclysmically different from those that are alive today. So it's is it short termism in the political cycle? Is it short termism in the financial cycle? Or is it a lack of awareness of what's happening scientifically and therefore what it means for future generations? So the, the kind of political trade offs aren't really being met, aren't really being done properly. But what does it mean from a responsible investment perspective? Well, it, the just transition, as I know we've discussed in the film, is really difficult because you've got human rights consequences of competing groups. Um, but humanity is one. We should also be thinking about the future generations that could conceivably go, if we as a species get this right, could conceivably go for hundreds of millions of years. There are species alive today that have been along that, been alive that long. We've only been around for a few hundred thousand years. But if you think about the energy costs today and the costs on future generations, those trade-offs, they're not really being made by investors, by politicians, by economists, because they discount the future or in some cases completely ignore it. So that, that's the kind of the hard, cold, stark reality of not just the Ukraine-Russia situation, the war there, but the reality of how we have to transition the global economy to be net zero on or before 2050. It needs to be a just transition so that um, electorates continue to vote for the change. Otherwise, it won't happen. But then the costs that they incur today because of things like that incursion, the, the Russian invasion, of the Ukraine, they 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 slow things down unhelpfully, of course. So that, there's a whole series of trade-offs there, Rachel. So I, I, there's no simple answer, is there? It's incredibly complicated. The issues raised in the film have become even more urgent 
in recent months with all the economic upheaval we've had, people are very nervous about their energy bills and cost of living and mortgages and so much more. Is this the moment to be thinking about moving my pension, my investments or savings towards sustainable options? I think that it, it's definitely a moment to make sure that your well, banking insurance and investment relationships, the, you know, whoever it is that provides it, that they are um, aware of the climate crisis, that they've committed to net zero, and if not, perhaps before you move your bank or your insurance or your investment or your pension relationships, you should first check that the company is net zero, and if not, then challenge them to become. Use your voice as a customer before you head for the exit. Um, I'd probably say that anyway, let alone because of the current economic situation. Of course, if anyone is thinking about changing their investment relationships, they should take advice. Uh, everyone will be in a different situation. But if the advice is that it's timely and your research doesn't convince you that your bank or your insurance company or your investment company is committed to net zero, then definitely it's time to move. Where could people find out more information? There are a number of organisations, um, non-governmental organisations, civil society groups that specialise in providing this kind of information. Um, Make My Money Matter is um, excellent, was set up by Richard Curtis, uh, run by Tony Burden. They've been for now some years uh, encouraging people to do just what it says on the tin, make their money matter. And there's a whole series of guidance on their website. There's also an organization called Share Action. Uh, it's been around for longer, best part of the last two, uh, two decades in different incarnations, run by Catherine Howth. And if individuals want to really get involved, Share Action enables them to understand how their pension is invested which specific companies they own, and then how to turn up at the AGM and ask challenging questions of the companies that you own. Because after all, if you own the company, you get a vote at the AGM. That's how the democracy of the business is supposed to work. And using that voice to encourage companies to transition to be net zero can be a very effective activity, it can be a very important action. And if enough people are doing that, clearly the company is more likely to um, take action at the pace and scale required. Uh, talking about uh, companies and the decisions they're making right now, uh, Harold Hamm, a US shale billionaire, has just announced plans to buy his Continental Resources company for 27 billion and take it off the stock market. He said privatization would give the company freedom to explore for more oil and gas uh, and grow as, and this is a quote, grow as we do our part to help secure America's energy independence without any encumbrance. Do you think others could follow so that they can proceed without, with less public scrutiny? And how do we tackle this? I do, I really do. I think it's a um, significantly negative outcome and it is an unintended consequence of the divestment calls to action or at least divestment activity by um, mainstream investors. The, those mainstream investors are selling not just because of the sentiment and they're, they're not really selling because of public pressure, they're selling because of the fundamentals of the underlying business. Now, people like the gentleman that you mentioned, his view on the fundamentals will be of course, quite focused on fossil fuel extraction being a um, economic activity going forwards. And that's the bet that he's taking. He's, in other words, betting that there won't be a material carbon price. There won't be effective regulation. There won't be effective policy. That's his investment bet. Now, that, that may turn out to be true. It would be perhaps rather good for his own pocket and his own private equity investors for maybe a few decades. But ultimately, the consequences that that would then um, provide for future generations, perhaps even his own children, would be so cataclysmic as to erode the value of the money that he made 
um, up to a point. So now that we know scientifically that the climate crisis is with us, there's various manifestations of it today, what people are now having to confront is the moral elements of those kinds of investments. And that individual, I think, is making an, a choice, a moral choice, perhaps that his own money will protect his descendants more um, as the climate gets worse and worse. But as everybody does that, if everybody does that, then that dooms civilization to that kind of outcome. It is the tragedy of Horizon that Mark Carney referred to, where what might be right for the individual today financially is not at all right for humanity tomorrow financially. Um, now, in terms of does that move off public markets lead to better outcomes for society? No, it doesn't. There's less public scrutiny, less disclosure, far less investor concern within the private equity space about climate change. Um, it does actually reflect that most mainstream investment institutions now realize that it is likely, some would say inevitable, that we will see a very material price on carbon, we will see policy, we will see regulation. And therefore the fundamentals of the business have changed in such a way as to make it a bad investment outcome. The, the question we all have to ask is maybe if, if it is inevitable, then will it come soon enough? And will it come over the investment time horizon? And we don't know the answer to that, um, but you don't know everything when you invest, of course, it's, it's effectively a judgment call. On that point, Ithaca Energy, which is a little known, but actually big North Sea operator, has just announced plans to list, uh, to stock list in London. Is London going to just continue to be a fossil fuel capital and funder? That will depend on whether the UK government and whether governments around the world change the fundamentals. I optimistically, very optimistically perhaps, believe that we will see a material price on carbon, that we will have to see the regulation and policy come in and as it does, we'll see less of those kinds of company list anywhere. It's not just whether they list in London that matters, it's whether they list anywhere and get new capital to do new projects. What we really need is a flow of capital towards the solutions providers, renewable energy businesses, offshore wind, onshore wind, um, rooftop solar, geothermal, battery storage technology, green hydrogen. Those, that's what we need to be capitalizing now at scale. We did a study about six months ago, which has discovered that of the 134 developing countries that signed the Paris Agreement, between now and the end of the decade, they need 13.8 trillion of investment capital in order to finance the growth of their economies in a net zero fashion. Now that's, that's not a cost, that should be seen as an investment opportunity that will in turn make money. But I, I would want my own money to be invested more in that transition and the companies that provide the solution, not just because I personally believe that that's economically and financially the right thing to do, but also I think it's morally the right thing to do. But, but markets are not moral. The markets are a construct, a human construct. They don't have a ethical mind, do they? Individuals do. So that's what we need to draw a distinction between, I think, the market and what it's rewarding, which is a function of the fundamentals, as well as what individuals do with their own money, which is more where ethics and morality come in. This was a very hot summer in the UK and a year for smashing climate records globally. How will this change the insurance sector in the year ahead? In, in terms of how it changes the insurance sector, I want to think about it over the decades ahead, mm -hmm. not just the year ahead. Um, before I do that, though, last year, Swiss Re, one of the world's biggest reinsurance businesses, has said that $270 billion was the economic loss due to natural catastrophe. Um, and that, that will include earthquake as well as floods and fire and uh, tornadoes, but the, predominantly it's the, the, the latter group. 
it also within that 111 billion dollars was the insured losses the gap between the 270 and the 111 is typically developing countries who can't afford the insurance premiums now going forwards whilst the premiums will go up because of weather damage weather loss there will come a point that whilst we can price the premium people won't be able to afford it i don't think that's going to happen next year or the year after but over coming decades and certainly by the end of the century if we start to see two and a half three three and a half four degrees worth of change then at a certain part it becomes uninsurable not not because we can't price the risk as i say but because people won't be able to afford the premium and if you haven't got enough people buying the insurance product you're not pooling the risk and then if one or the other of the individuals incurs the problem the rest of the pool can be used to repay that individual that had the issue incurred and that's how insurance works it's a pool of risk and if people can't afford it it will collapse as a business model and if for example people had to spend three four five percent of their house price on their home insurance what does that do can they afford it i think probably not most people and that means their mortgage if they have one will be in technical default they'd have to sell their home and if everyone's having to do that simultaneously because climate change will affect everyone everywhere then that will obviously suppress house prices and mean the collateral of the banks that they own for the mortgage will become less valuable now you can imagine how the dominoes might topple or the cascading risks as it's called within financial stability could come about as a consequence of the financial crisis and the climate crisis and if, if, if you go back to 2008 2007 the financial crisis that uh, was precipitated by the subprime mortgage market that was just eight percent of the US mortgage market that led to the global recession and cost in the to the tune of about 30 trillion for the global countries to bail out the financial system 30 trillion now as i've just described climate change could cause a financial crisis and if eight percent of the u.s mortgage market was enough to do it last time if most mortgages in most countries are all experiencing irreversible climate change simultaneously I can't even begin to imagine what the consequences of that would be to the financial system in general. And if, 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 if that collapses, it's said that we're three meals away from anarchy. And that's the kind of thing that we're looking into with these extreme physical risks. So what, what's the right thing to do today? People talk about the just transition and they're right to be alarmed about the human rights consequences. But ultimately, I think the only just transition is the one we do just get on with. So, Steve, as an insurance company, as an investor, what do you think the science is actually telling us? Critical question. So scientifically, we know that since the Industrial Revolution, the world's average surface air temperature is about 1.1 degrees warmer than it was. The best ambition of the Paris Agreement is one and a half degrees, no warmer than that. At one and a half, it's said by the UN that even there we've lost between 80 to 90 percent of the world's coral reefs. The upper limit, two degrees, almost all of it's gone. Now, even all of the country's nationally determined contributions for the Paris Agreement, if you add all, all the policies up that they say they're going to do, we're told by the International Energy Association that that gets us to about 2.6 degrees of change. Now, 2.6 might sound or feel like nicer summer holidays, but it's not. It's an enormous amount more energy in the system, which will cause much more flood and fire. To, to put that into stark relief, at three degrees, which of course 2.6 isn't far from, the science suggests that 74% of the world's population, if they continue to live where they do today, will experience midday, mid air, midsummer air temperatures, which are hotter than the human body can cope with. So the human body will shuts down at what's called a thermal bulb temperature of about 35 degrees. And that's a combination of the actual temperature as well as the humidity. 
And some of the heat bombs that we've seen over the last three or four years have led to places where people literally, their body, either they have to get into aircon or perhaps into cold rivers, which will be warming up, or, or their body will shut down. Now, if 74% of the world's population has to either do that or migrate uh, at three degrees, that's plausible by the end of the century, um, then given that the implied temperature change of most stock exchanges is about three and a half degrees, half degree warmer than that, we should be really challenging the politicians and the policymakers to make sure that we get nowhere near two degrees because it's at two degrees that it's more likely than not that we start to see these runaway feedback loops which lead to a ongoing worse situation. For example, if the tundra melt, melts in Siberia, that releases an enormous amount of methane, which in turn causes the greenhouse to warm even more. Now, as an insurance company, we have looked quite carefully at the science because we have a fiduciary duty to our shareholders and to our customers to make sure that their own long-term interests are, are looked after by us. And knowing the science is as bad as that is really why I'm here talking to you, to try and communicate to people that we do need to get on with dealing with this climate crisis collectively, because it, it could actually become a civilizational one, perhaps not over our lifetimes, although that is becoming increasingly the case, isn't it, with some of the weather that we've seen, but certainly over the lifetimes of our next generation and the one behind that too. And as a legacy, no one wants to see that. But that's actually where we're heading at the moment, business as usual. The UN, in other words, it can be reassuring that we're only aiming at, say, even 2.6 or 2 degrees. But the reality of the global economy is there's more oil and gas out there than we can possibly burn and stay anywhere close to the Paris Agreement. In the film, Sir David King says, I believe that what we do over the next five years will determine the future of humanity for the next millennium. What key changes need to take place in the UK and globally to stop this window of opportunity being squandered? It's an imperative, really. He's, he's, he's an amazing guy, he's a scientist. He's been very clear and dedicated almost all of his professional life to this particular challenge. Uh, he and others are deeply worried and I share that concern. So what needs to change? One, we need countries to make the polluter pay. In the jargon, that means internalize the externalities. The way you do that is through tax, through subsidy, tax the bad, you subsidize the good. You can also create a, a trading scheme or a market mechanism like an emissions trading scheme. Um, we can also have standards and regulations and consumer awareness policies, all of those coming together can internalize the externality and make the polluter pay. We need to have a material cost of carbon. And that means that when analysts are looking at whether the particular investment opportunity is a good one or not, if polluting costs the individual who pollutes, then that cost line will mean, of course, that the capital gets allocated at the margin more elsewhere. So you have to have a material carbon price. That's the first thing that needs to happen. Secondly, it should be recognized that the markets that we have created are human constructs. Um, over the last three, four centuries, uh, various legal mechanisms have been created, like limited liability, listings, and so on, have enabled it, companies to raise enormous amounts of capital. Now, we need to rethink banking, insurance, and investment regulation so that it encourages all three of those sectors that obviously bank, underwrite and capitalise the real economy. They need to be put on a basis that is um, net zero, that encourages a trajectory of all the financial institutions towards helping make sure we mobilise markets and money to deliver the Paris Agreement. Really, I think the biggest question we should all be asking ourselves is how do we harness markets to deliver a smooth, well-managed and just transition to net zero on or before 2050? It's a huge, huge challenge. And 
I don't know anyone in the world that has a full answer to that, but I know thousands of people that are trying to look at various elements of it. A final element that needs to happen, we should all recognize that the United Nations and its framework convention on climate change and the conference of parties process, um, whilst good and whilst staffed by lots of very passionate people who are doing everything they possibly can to help obviate this deep climate crisis that's possibly among, uh, upon us, it was never designed in a way that was fit for purpose. It was never designed with a governance structure that enabled the UN to really harness markets. And it's the member states that have to go back to each of their capitals and make sure the central banks and the finance ministries are harnessing money to deliver the Paris Agreement. And that's the missing piece at the moment for me at the, at the United Nations. We really need the other organisations, the World Banks, the IMFs, the IFCs, the IBRD, KFW, and so on and so on. These these development banks to um, mobilise private finance as well as their own public finance and help finance the two trillion a year that it's said that we need to move global economies onto a net zero footing. I know that's not a clean, crisp answer for you there, Rachel, but it is a hopefully the beginnings of a comprehensive one that recognises that it is all sectors and all things that need to change and we do not have long, we do need to get on with that. And David's right, um, yeah, five years, five years isn't very long to do all of that, but my goodness, we just have to get on with it. Well, thank you, Steve, for joining us today and sharing so many of these thoughts with us. I, I certainly have a lot to think about now. The Oil Machine is now showing in cinemas across the UK, and you can also contact us about hosting a community screening for your organisation, business or group, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org. Goodbye. <laughs>